My name is Gary Kamarjan. I'm a senior principal software engineer working for Red Hat. I work mainly with the developer tools of, uh, of Red Hat, um, one of them being Eclipse J. This talk is about that one, uh, Eclipse J. Um, so before I start, I usually start with a question. How long does it take for your developers to get started when they on their first day at job at their job? Can they start coding? Two weeks. Two weeks? No. Typical two weeks? Longer? Longer, yeah. <laughs> Been there. <laughs> so we did ask this question on a uh, to to our customers. Then you're not alone. No one actually starts in a day. The ones that say two to five, yeah, I'm, I'm skeptical about that too. <laughs> so it typically takes like two weeks for, for many to get started. And then it goes, it can go very, very high, like three weeks uh, we have seen got numbers larger than three weeks, actually, to get, just to get started. You hired a person to sit on your premise and code. It takes like a month before he actually has something uh, that he can start with. So one of the things that um, Eclipse J provides is we provide you with a, with the, the best development environment that you can get for the task at hand. So we give you a package development environment. It runs on a, on a, on a container. And instead of you building your own development environment, we, gi we give you that development environment with a, with a click. So you get started, we give you an ID, we check out your project files, all your code, and then we also set up your runtime environment on the way so that you can actually start get started with one click. Too, too, too good to be true? Okay, let's see. <laughs> Challenge accepted. <laughs> So this is my first day. I have some tasks, right? So I, I need to get started with my code. So this is someone actually created this task for me, my team lead, and said, hey, you can use this workspace to fix the bug. Let's click, let's see what happens. It's initializing your workspace starting the workspace runtime. What it does right now is that it's actually pulling in a container and starting the ID, starting a few uh, agents that we use for executing stuff and, and, and terminal access. And once all of it is done, it will load the browser to the IDE and we'll start checking out the code. I'm ready. I have all I need. My source code is here. I have terminal access. Let's close this. I have my tools. Maven is already configured for me. And this project just needs that. Um, this is a Spring Boot project, so Maven is basically all I need. But if, if it was a different kind of project, it would actually be able to set up the, uh, the project runtime as well. If it was a Wildfly, JBoss EAP, or whatever your poison is, it would just set it up, put it out there, and, and you're ready to go. I can just start coding right now. And once I'm done, I do my commit, push the commit, and, and um, that's my first contribution, basically. We could, we could take this further 
and make it even easier, but we'll get to that later during the talk. So that's basically your startup time. Um, and the way that you're able to do this is it's containerized, right? Your container, you can give your developers the right container that they can do their job with. Let's say that you switched from WebSphere to EAP. You can do that. Your development environment, it's not that, it's not that you need to go and, and, and if you have a thousand developers working on WebSphere, you don't need to go to a thousand desktops and change the runtime environment for every single one of them. You basically configure a new container and all your workspaces are updated with it. Actually, funny, I was, uh, while I was getting ready for this talk, last night I went to the hotel and just, you know, just for the kicks of it, I tried to, to run my demo and it didn't work. Someone at the office updated the image that I was using and they introduced something that didn't, uh, that didn't agree with what I was doing. So that's the, you won't have that problem because you probably won't be using the, the nightly build, but that's what I do. So uh, the developer workspaces are centrally hosted and it includes your ID, your project files. You can manage them very easily. Uh, there are security permissions built into it. We will look at that uh, in a moment. So it obviously accelerates your onboarding. Um, and then it removes all the inconsistencies. Your developer workspace is, is exactly the same for everyone. And it's exactly the same for uh, image that you're running on your uh, production. So that's the other benefit that you are getting. So when you're creating your workspace, what you're actually doing is you're starting with your production image that you will be running on your production. And then saying that, okay, this is a Java application, so I need Java tools. I'll, let me just show you that. So this is how you configure a workspace. Let's go back, look at our workspaces. Where am I? If my browser works. There. So this is the workspace that was configured for me. And if I look at the tools that I have here, it's just not working well right now. I think the scaling is just cutting the some of the view. Oh, I was logged out, sorry. There. So if I look at my, what I have on my workspace, basically I have terminal, a workspace API, an execution agent. Those are basically the standard things. But then if you want to add JSON language support to your work workspace, you can just add that or a PHP language support to your workspace. So basically you start with your uh, production environment and then you start adding these tools into your workspace. That's what we call demoding uh, your workspace. Let's go back to the presentation now. So, um, if you were in the in the in the previous talk when when we talked about the the build pipelines, Che actually doesn't change anything on that. So Che is like any other IDE tool, any other editor that that you would use. The 
advantages of, of working with the workspace is before the Comet, you're actually working on your production environment. You, you, do, you, ha you get a lot of benefits of working on your production environment pre-Comet. But once you do the Comet, it just goes to your regular build and deploy pipeline. It goes to, through all those steps. And we integrate with that as well. We can, we can get the feedback from your pipeline into your workspace while you're working on it. Uh, and also the other benefit that, that you, you get is workspaces are shareable. I'm running a workspace. If I give you the URL for it, you can just create the same workspace or access the one that I have running right now. We can perfectly share it, and, and it is shared securely, so. So what are the superpowers of, of Che? Well, we kind of talked about it. I, ran, I went ahead with, with my de demo, sorry. Uh, it, run, it, it is the runtime from production. Um, the demo I have runs the images from Docker Hub, but you can use a private registry for it. So if you have your own uh, own uh, images for uh, that that you don't want, you do not want to share with the world, those are there. Uh, you can start from any image, or you can even start with a Docker file. You can say that hey, there, here is my Docker file. Turn that into a workspace. Uh, uh, we have pre-built or custom stacks. So you can set, start with, oh, okay, I don't really know what kind of an image I should have on production, but I know that it's a Java application. And we will create one for you, suggest one for you, and then, then you can modify it. And of course, you get SSH access. Uh, we talked about dev moding. So when we dev mode something, we add language servers, we add compilers, we add debuggers. Uh, we have a few workspace agents for synchronizing wor workspaces and so on and so forth. Uh, all the IntelliSense comes with uh, language servers. The language servers, if, if you are, have used it, it's the same, th same kind of language tooling that you get on Visual Studio. Or that that or if you have used it in Adam IDE, they use the same same things as well. So um, you get terminal access, and also we have a very extensive command system where you can run a set of commands in different workspace events. For instance, when your workspace is loaded, you can run a command to open a file to a certain location and highlight certain section. Uh, of course, we do support zip files, <laughs> SVN. Well, we kind of support it. Um, Git support. SVN support is still available, but we are not actively main maintaining it. Not much happens on SVN anyway. Um, you can live sync a repo to a container. So if you have a code uh, locally, uh, you can live sync that to a container. Uh, you can use private repositories, like private Git repositories or public Git repositories. Basically, we don't care where your Git is hosted. It can be on GitHub. It can be on anywhere. Um, we do provide a few bells and whistles for GitHub, but they are not mandatory. Uh, we have something called factories, which you have actually seen uh, a moment ago. Um, so the factories are our ways of creating these uh, workspaces uh, from a template. And that template can be invoked through a URL. So you just give it a URL, and that URL will, will when, when that URL is accessed, it will create a workspace and take you to the workspace. Basically, that was the trick that I used from Trello to create the, the workspace. And let me show you what that URL actually looks like. So 
So it's basically just says, hey, this is, this is the URL of my Che instance, which is running locally on this laptop. And then it's a URL that takes me to the GitHub repository where the code is. That's all there is to it. And once that, uh, when, once the, once Che loads the, this repository, the first thing that it does is it goes and looks into a file. Start that. called factory.json, which basically defines everything that I want on this workspace. So that's the trick. There's, there's no trick. The trick is there's no trick. There's no magic. It's, it's all there. Uh, you can easily modify it. You can tell that, oh, these are the servers that I want. This is the, the memory that I want you to allocate for this container. And Che just looks at it and says, okay, there you go. Your container is ready, running for you and I'll secure it for you. And of course, we talked about the one-click onboarding, but then you can share your workspaces. Let's say that you have a workspace, you want to share it with your friends um, or your organization. Uh, that's also possible and very easy to do. Oh, I'm in the wrong place, but let's go here. You can see that these are the developers that have permissions to this workspace. Because I created it, I have read, use, run, configure, and set permissions, but I can add a developer to it. Uh, let's let me add myself again. Of course, I'm not registered on, this is my local URL server, but you, basically you can add developers to it that are already uh, registered on, on Che, on, in this instance of Che, and you can actually add <coughs> organizations to, um, to Che as well, so that Instead of sharing a, a workspace with a single user, or an organization is a, is a, is a uh, team of developers. So you can, instead of ch sharing a uh, workspace with a single user, you can just share it with uh, the, a team of developers. So nothing on the workspaces is actually persisted, except for uh, we attach a volume where the project files are stored. So we guarantee that that is persisted and, and backed up. Uh, you, you always will be able to use it, but anything else you can just update. That's, the, that's actually the good thing about it. Let's say that you, have, you, wanna use a, a, you want all your developers to use the later version of Maven. That way we can update it and it will be transparent to your developers. So that's how we centrally manage uh, manage that. Anything other than your project files uh, can change any, at any moment. So typically there are two possibilities, right? Once when a developer checks out a file, you work on it and uh, you can check it back in. That's going to go into the repository. In the meantime, when he's working on it, that can go into the local volume. Yeah. Right? And uh, I'm starting to think about the VDI that can go into this in the coming years. So with the VDI dash desktop as a service, where this kind of image can really fit well, so right. developer doesn't need to have anything on their local, just go spin up their VDI, get the image, and... Uh, yeah, we, we, we are planning to experiment with that with Chase Server, actually. Uh, we haven't done that yet. There was so in the federal space disconnected environment, even for development, are yeah. very common. Could Which is then? Could you describe how that would be, yeah. how this yeah, so that means that you're gonna just run your Chase server on your internal OpenShift instance, like I do on, on my laptop, right? And with that, you you everything else will, will 
So with, with, that's basically the, 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 the gist of it, right? You're, you have your own OpenShift environment. We basically do not uh, require anything else other than the, the OpenShift to be present <coughs> to run. Uh, the GitHub integrations and all that are just optional pieces that I have shown for the demo purposes. Uh, you can have your own internal um, Docker registry. You can have your own internal uh, Maven repositories. And Che will just work with them. So, Sorry, could you repeat that question? So it's the Disconnected uh, environments where you have a secure network, will Che work within that secure network? And the answer is yes. Yeah, I think the, um, the reason behind that, we get this a lot, especially with WebIDs, and I uh, really appreciate Gorka making time in to talk about it here, is that in this centralized world, the, the control that you're getting through Che requires you to be connected. This is a cloud development platform, and you cannot be attached to the cloud similarly as you could not be attached to an open source cluster that you're developing to, or a Git repo, or the CI CD pipeline that is supposed to be executing everything for validating your requirements and protocol, et cetera, then it's not applicable to uh, your use case, right? If you can't stay connected, then it's uh, not necessarily appropriate for your development challenge. Um, by no means is this appropriate for everyone, but for the ones that have the ability to remain connected. It's an extremely powerful tool to um, deliver software uh, reliably, repeatedly, rapidly, and with a decent ROI. But, guardrails for now. And, and I would say, you know, being disconnected could be a temporary thing. You're not always disconnected. Maybe you're in the so, organization. But, you can sit but, your okay, so is, is the question about being disconnected, or is it because the, the isolated network? So the well, developer is... I think it, both yeah. In, in, a, in a typical developer environment that uses Git all the time, they're very used to using their own copy of the repo, yep. being able to be offline if they want to be, being able to do development on their laptop to the full extent possible, and yep. then when they get connected, they can update yep. their repos that yep. are centrally located. So that longer periods of disconnection we do not support right now. Uh, we do support, for instance, the, the disconnectedness that you you go into to, to, through a tunnel. We do support that. We have some sort of a, a buffer that we keep on the browser side that will sync uh, when the connection is restored. Uh, but otherwise, if you want to go offline for a week and come back, uh, we don't really support that. We do require so, so some sort of an access to the workspace. Are you running Minishift locally? Yeah, right now it's. And you're running it on Minishift? Yep. So you could, you could run separate from the network. Yeah, that is one option that we are, we are looking at where you start your workspace initially on, on your mothership, uh, OpenShift, and then, uh, then port, uh, move that workspace. In your to your local mini shift and run from there for a while and then sync it back to uh, mothership. So we are looking into that option uh, for offline working, but right now that it's not there. Okay. So it's not there today. It's possible, but it's not there today. So those are there's a lot of a ton of changes coming in on on, on the Che environment. There the innovation is very. Uh, Rapid on Che. Uh, I don't know if you're aware of it. It's been like a year. We acquired Code Envy, uh, which were the main contributors to the upstream Eclipse Che project. So um, uh, it, the, it's very rap rapid. Actually, uh, I just wanted to show, for instance, the we're actually changing the IDE a bit as well. Let me just show that. So we are coming up with a completely new um, ID. Uh, we are redoing the ID for Eclipse Che. Our, we are changing our technology from 
Uh, the old ID was, was built with GWT. Uh, the new ID is built with TypeScript. Um, and the benefit of doing that is we are, the new ID will be able to uh, have uh, dynamic uh, plugins. So during your development, you, you, you will be able to add plugins like you would add with Eclipse or VS Code or Visual Studio Code. So uh, that's the same idea that we are building. And you will see that the, the ID right now looks a very much like a Visual Studio Code. Uh, that's because we are using the same editor, actually. <laughs> so the next version will, will come with that sort of bells and whistles uh, as well if it comes up. Oh, it's coming up, but it's... Oh, by the way, this is... If you want to try Che, a good way of doing that is to go to the UR, this URL, che.openshift.io. We have a hosted instance of Che where you can take a look at things. And while that is trying to get up, for some reason taking a longer time than it should, um, let's go back to our So this is the one that we just created. So we talked about factories, right? So what, another thing that you can do with factories is you can actually create a new factory from an existing workspace. Let's say that I have chosen this workspace. I said create. And what I'll do is I'll just, for the sake of it, add an open file command here. So if you look at here, you will see that there are two, two URLs that you can copy and share with, with your colleagues. And this will allow you to start from your workspace and add some certain commands and uh, share that workspace. Uh, it's very often, actually, uh, true story. <laughs> In the last summit, we actually used Che for developing the, the summit uh, demo. And it, very often we got stuck at places where um, we required the actual uh, development team to take a look at the code. And Che was a, ve a very good way of doing it. And that team actually used the open file command very often where they could just point to the code where the development team needed to look. So. Uh, and then if I open this URL, it will just generate me another uh, copy of the, the workspace. But what it will do is it will open up that file that I, I have asked for it to open. Hopefully there is a readme there. Now I'm run running more and more workspaces, therefore my laptop is getting slower and slower. Perhaps I should just shut down a couple. Yeah, that always helps. And another thing that, that you will notice is with the web IDs, usually it is not po very possible to have good code assist, good IntelliSense for compiled languages, for instance, C++ and Java. Uh, with Che, we do have that. Um, we, we, we have exactly the same support, Java support that Eclipse IDE has uh, through our Java language server. And we have exactly the same kind of support I think the current version doesn't, but the, the future Xcode is going to have. It's the C-Lang uh, language server that, that we support. 
Okay, so there wasn't one. So um, if you compare it with any other web ID that is out there today, the compiled language support for Che is, is I don't think anyone else has it right now. Uh, we do talk with those communities as well. Um, I don't want to name, but they are far behind that they are trying to catch up with the compiled language support. In essence, it's completely a web ID thing. You don't need to run it properly. No. Yeah. So this is the new uh, layout that, that we are working on. So this is the new IDE layout. Uh, you may notice that it is very similar to uh, VS Code. Um, it's, this is basically the same editor that Visual Studio Code uses. Uh, it's just embedded on a, on a browser, so it doesn't need to work on Electron. Uh, we have the, the outlines, and the extension mechanism is also here. Uh, you can see that we have a bunch of extensions for this running. Um, of course, you have Git support, as you would expect. Um, so everything else will be basically a bunch of plugins that you will be able to pull in depending on your configuration for the workspace. I'm not sure if I ran out of time. I did. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> if you have any questions, I'm here uh, now and the rest of today. Thank you very much.